Danny, thank you very much. It's a great um, pleasure to be here, uh, particularly to talk about Bricksmith. Thank you for your uh, not too long uh, introduction about me. Um, indeed, I did spend a long time both in Berlin with a battalion and then uh, with Bricksmiths. And it's Bricksmiths, obviously, that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, on the 19th of March, some of you may have, I'm not sure if, it, if anybody was able to attend it in, in person, uh, but online, uh, Steve Gibson gave a talk, an overview of uh, Bricksmiths. Uh, he's a, um, a published author on the subject and served in the mission, as we always called Bricksmiths. He served in the mission during its final um, year or so uh, as it closed down and the wall, the wall came down and then the mission uh, closed down. But my aim today is to deal with something um, a bit more specific, uh, and that is to deal with um, an operational issue out on the ground, um, the um, interaction uh, between uh, the East German uh, Ministry of State Security, the Stasi, uh, and uh, Bricksmiths as we went about our intelligence collection uh, activities uh, out on the ground. Just as a reminder, of course, this is how Germany was divided up between the four uh, victorious powers and put under military uh, control um, at the end of the war. And, of course, for the purposes of this story, the most important thing really is the location of, of Berlin, um, deep in the heart of the Soviet zone of occupation. Berlin itself also divided up between the four allies, uh, with um, the Soviets having their sector uh, being East Berlin uh, and uh, the three Western allies with their sectors in West Berlin. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind as well that Bricksmiths did not operate in East Berlin. East Berlin was the province of Berlin Infantry Brigade where intelligence collection was concerned. And Potsdam, the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the picture, uh, lying to the southwest of Berlin, uh, the historic um, garrison town uh, for Prussia, uh, was where Bricksmiths and the other Allied missions uh, were based uh, during the Cold War. At first, it was tricky for the uh, four um, powers to get along with one, with one another, and it slowly became clear that more formal arrangements should be put in place than the, as I say, slightly chaotic arrangements that followed immediately after the end of the war. And it was decided that there should be liaison missions. This had been uh, floated and agreed uh, in 1944 in London in the agreement for uh, the mechanisms to control Germany after the war. And it was not until early 1946 uh, that the processes were put in train to deliver uh, liaison missions. Um, the great men, here you have Montgomery and Zhukov, the great men said, let there be liaison, and everybody got on with uh, creating uh, liaison. Liaison is one of these strange foreign words that we borrow into English. And um, everybody nods sagely when you say liaison in the hope that you won't ask them to define what liaison is. Uh, but it's a very elastic term, and uh, there proved to be a great advantage to the elasticity, the imprecision of the word uh, liaison. Having told their staffs to get on with coming up with an agreement, uh, this is the agreement that was come up, that was um, produced uh, between General Brown Robertson and uh, his counterpart, General Malinin, the two chiefs of staff, British and Soviet, a bilateral agreement. Um, interestingly enough, the first draft of it uh, came out in April 1946, and the final version, which this is a, a copy of, uh, only one thing of substance had changed from that initial draft to the final production of the agreement. And I don't think there are many, uh, or many documents where can, uh, there can have been so few uh, major amendments. And that <coughs> amendment reduced from 12 to 11 the number of British and Soviet officers who could be in one another's um, uh, zones of occupation. So this is the document that was produced. It is reciprocal and bilateral uh, and important. And a simple document, unchanged for the next 44 years. So never amended in any sense. And what did it call upon um, the staffs to do? To come up with liaison missions. 
uh, that were to be exchanged with one another. The British were to have 11 officers and 20 other ranks in the Soviet zone of occupation. And reciprocally, the Soviets had the same uh, rights in our zone. And uh, what were these missions to do? You can't read it here, but you can take my word for it. It says the, the objective of these missions is to maintain liaison. Everybody nodded sagely that they knew what liaison was, and on they went. But there was never any attempt in this agreement to define what liaison meant. In April 1947, so about six months after the British agreement was finalized with the Soviets, the French and the Americans made similar but not identical deals uh, with um, the Soviets. The French came up with an agreement that allowed them to have 18 all ranks um, in the Soviet zone and vice versa, and the, and the Americans fewer still at only 14. We don't know why the British had 31, but the others had 18 and 14. But if you put the, the French and American missions together, you can see they, that makes 32, we had 31. So we had a sort of built-in capability advantage if we chose to use it. <coughs> we couldn't go exactly where we wanted to in East Germany. The robertson Malinin agreement and the other two agreements uh, both said that there were areas that were to be um, out of bounds, prohibited to these missions. And as time went by, these prohibitions, these restrictions became very formalized. And this is one of the maps from the, the 1980s, and this is the 1988 permanently restricted area map. And about a third of East Germany was out of bounds to the three Western missions. Um, these yellow splodges, to be technical about them, these yellow splodges covered nuclear storage sites, um, major headquarters, political holiday homes, all sorts of manner of things. But if a third of East Germany was out of bounds to us, exactly the same percentage of West Germany was put out of bounds to the Soviets. So this is where reciprocity uh, came into it. And if you were caught in one of these areas, you had to expect to be made persona non grata, which made all the training and everything rather wasted. So we tended uh, not to go into these yellow, permanently restricted areas. The robertson malinin Agreement and its counterparts also agreed to temporary restricted areas. And this is a map of, of a temporary restricted area from 1983. Uh, and although it's not clear, uh, it places it in uh, an out-of-bounds status an area to the south of the city of Gotha for, t for 15 days. The moment these 15-day restrictions came to an end, we would rush into these areas to try and work out why they'd put it out of bounds for 15 days. Sometimes it just seemed sheer devilment, but sometimes there'd been a, a divisional deployment or something like that. The other apparent restriction that was obvious uh, in East Germany were these things, mission, res mission restriction signs. There were thousands of these signs, uh, certainly by the 1980s, on trees, concrete posts, and they appear, if you read them, they appear to tell you that military missions cannot go past them. But, uh, and they, generally speaking, were clustered around sensitive East German as opposed to Soviet installations, because most of the sensitive Soviet installations were already in a permanently restricted area. Uh, we, on the other hand, the three Western missions from the 70s onwards, uh, dis, um, the, our bosses, as it were, decided that these mission restriction signs had no legal authority because they weren't mentioned in the 1946 and 1947 agreements, and therefore, for us, that represented an advertisement that there's something interesting going on behind, or they wouldn't have put the sign up. So slightly counterproductive from the perspective of the East Germans who made these rather smart signs. Of course, it was no surprise to the Soviets or the East Germans what we were doing in East Germany. We'd been doing it for, for over 40 years. Uh, they could see what we were doing. They were doing whatever they wanted to do, whatever liaison meant to the Soviets, they were doing uh, in West Germany. And as General Koshevoy here is saying in 1969, um, you've got a job to do, just do it politely. And if you overdo it, expect to get whacked. Um, and that's about where it came down to. But they understood that there was advantage to it. And of course, it also helped the Soviets that there were Western observers on the ground 
uh, in the former Soviet zone in East Germany, because that way they, we could prove for our own satisfaction that what they were claiming was actually true. There's a sort of safety valve aspect to these liaison missions operating on each other's uh, territory. Things changed in 1949 with the emergence of two new German sovereign states. First, the Federal Republic of Germany was created, and the, the documents uh, show that Konrad Adenauer, the first chancellor, uh, agreed with the three uh, military governors who were bowing out that these military liaison missions should continue, the Soviet ones in West Germany, that it was, an inf although it was a, a, an infringement on this new German sovereignty, it nevertheless had a part to play uh, in managing uh, the international situation. Uh, and so um, throughout the time of the rest of the Cold War, uh, the three Soviet missions in West Germany were accredited to the Western military powers and not to the German government. And exactly the same happened slightly later in 1949 when the German Democratic Republic was set up, East Germany. This is Wilhelm Pieck, its first president. And undoubtedly, um, it was an irritation from day one for the East German regime that they had foreign, as they would have seen them, spies operating on their territory, but the Soviets undoubtedly made it clear to the East German regime that they had to put up with it. They had to put up with the French, the British, and the Americans operating on their soil and only accredited to the military, uh, Soviet military, and not to the East German authorities. Of course, the East Germans weren't, again, weren't going to um, take, take this lightly. They were going to try and do something about it. And this is the role uh, of, the, uh, of the Stasi, of the secret police, whose logo there is on the left, and their, their job was to protect the Socialist Unity Party, <clears throat> effectively the Communist Party, but with several other small parties sort of absorbed into it, um, but the ruling party. And it's the job, or was the job, of the Ministry of State Security to protect uh, the regime uh, against all threats, uh, including uh, against us. The Minister of State Security was run by this character, uh, Eric Mielke. Uh, Mielke was a, a pre-war street fighter who'd murdered a policeman uh, in the early 30s and rose after the war to become the Minister uh, for State Security and held the post for uh, several decades. And perhaps unsurprisingly, there were Germans who came forward uh, to try and prove themselves to be even better than, than the KGB at being Czechists. The, this was an organ of control uh, that at first was under very close Soviet scrutiny, but by the time we get to the 50s, uh, it starts to be allowed to operate um, with a free hand, as it were, uh, in its own country, although the Soviets were always there um, giving them advice, as it were. The main organization that faced us uh, was Main Department 8, which was charged with surveillance, uh, not just of the Western military missions and diplomats, but of all overseas foreign threats uh, to the East German uh, regime. Uh, there were 90,000 or so members of the, of the Ministry of State Security, and of, of them about 5,000, just under 5,000 by, by 1988, were part of Main Department 8. And uh, they were the people charged with uh, keeping an eye on us. Most of the time, fairly benign. Uh, you've got a load of loafing men. Um, but their, just their presence um, was fairly obvious most of the time that they were there. Uh, and what I think they were worried about was us doing abnormal things. Normality is quite reassuring. Abnormality is something that may alarm you. We were looking for abnormal developments in East Germany. They were looking to see us doing something abnormal as well. Some of them, for some of them, it was a fairly cushy billet. This is young Werner, and young Werner was the odd job man at the, the Bricksmiths uh, Villa, the mission house in Potsdam. And his job was to help the ladies in the kitchen bring the shopping in and do um, supervise the gardener and things like that. Uh, but we were convinced and behaved on the assumption that all the rooms were bugged in the mission house. And uh, maybe it was a fair assumption, given that, like all odd job men, 
young Werner had a degree in electronic engineering, which slightly, <laughs> slightly narrowed, narrowed down the possibilities. So although most of the time the Stasi were fairly passive and um, benign, uh, if we got too close to, to very sensitive East German uh, installations or became too aggressive in our intelligence collection, which we could do sometimes, uh, they would leap into action. Two young men in a car, a pretty obvious sign in East Germany or dealing with the secret police, there was a 10-year waiting list for a car. So two young men in a car are probably up to no good. And of course, when they get the camera out, it's a bit, it's game, set and match. Um, but this was their way normally of saying, you've got close enough, that's enough and no further. What the, whatever they were, they weren't uh, incompetent. And uh, they were working on their own home turf. And this is uh, one of a series of photographs. That's me in 1982. So while we're watching a train in the distance, um, I've got a couple of dozen photographs of the, in this series of the Stasi taking pictures of us taking pictures of trains. Um, so they were, they were good at what they did. And of course, they could choose their OPs. It's their country. They were in a position to, um, to you know, they had a head start on us in some ways. We'll go back to the, the 1950s briefly. This is the period when the East German regime is building its confidence and so and the, the Stasi are building their competence. And in 1958, uh, there was um, a mass demonstration of popular fury outside the British and uh, American mission houses in Potsdam about British and American policy in North Africa, some long-forgotten crisis. But it led to a sort of rent-a-mob crisis um, and a certain amount of damage. And here's the Bricksmith's quartermaster and one of the cars. He'd been done over and bloodied, and the car had been wrecked. And this was really a signal for the Bricksmith's and American families, who up till that stage, most of them had lived in Potsdam. They were then withdrawn to a safer uh, environment in West Berlin, and the Soviets provided uh, a more what they perceived as a more secure um, villa for each of the American and British uh, missions. Um, and uh, there were no reoccurrences of this spontaneous violence uh, thereafter. This wasn't uh, the end of the story. Uh, in 1960, uh, this gentleman, Walter Ulbricht, uh, just taken over as the head of the National Defence Council, and there was a, um, an engineered incident in the middle of 1960 where the chief of the Bricksmith's mission, Brigadier Packard, was ambushed um, along with four other members of the British mission, and again, they were manhandled, um, and all the equipment was taken from their, their patrol vehicles. Um, and at a, at a press conference, Walter Ulbricht exposed all this espionage equipment to the world and said what dreadful people these awful capitalists were. But despite that, the Soviets obviously put their hand on his shoulder and said, you may not like it, but it carries on because we want it uh, to carry on. But it was clear from um, the early 1960s that they were, as it were, on our case and were not going to... Uh, not going to let us get away with, with murder, as it were. It's only in the 1970s that we get to what appears to be a campaign of violence um, sponsored against uh, the missions. Uh, and in 1976, just outside a, um, a surface-to-air missile site near the town of Callow, um, a Bricksmith uh, tour vehicle was hunted down effectively and uh, crashed into by a, a large truck. Uh, two motorcyclists had blocked the path and as the Bricksmith's vehicle tried to get away, one of these large 10-ton trucks uh, smashed into uh, the Bricksmith's car. Uh, the damage done to it was fairly substantial. Here it is on its recovery trailer. And Sergeant Thomas of the Royal Corps of Transport was trapped in the car for three hours and when eventually released, spent 15 days uh, in an East German hospital, an experience which I'm glad to say he survived. Um, but this was uh, you know, a, a very clear case of, of um, approved of violence by the, by the Stasi. Uh, here's another view of the, uh, of the vehicle. And uh, it's the... F oh, sorry. 
I'm trying to go backwards. Uh, it's the first case that we have um, where um, there's a report from the Stasi um, about one of these um, incidents with a, uh, with a Bricksmith um, vehicle out on the ground. And uh, it's not clear whether it was a deliberate ramming or whether they were simply approving of it after the event. But as with all these incidents I'm going to describe, they were always written up by the, the People's Police, the Folks Polizei, as collisions, as accidents. They were never uh, accurately reported as deliberate attempts to, to ram um, mission vehicles. It's at this stage that it, um, it's worth mentioning that we have, in recent years, um, imp increased our knowledge about the past immensely. Um, in December uh, 1989, the people in East Germany seized the uh, central and regional offices of the Stasi and stopped the shredders shredding all the archives and everything. And so there's a, a mass of documentation that's available. Um, you can get your own file. I have my own Stasi file, 125 pages of confirmed criminality. But there's, um, the, there's all, an immense amount of stuff. Uh, Eric Milker was um, very cautious about computers. He thought the Americans somehow might steal his soul if it, everything was in a computer. It wasn't that daft after all. And, um, but so there's a huge paper trail left behind. And uh, 180 kilometers of shelving, 100 meters, only 100 meters of it deals with the military liaison missions, but it's still quite an archive of an enemy's insights and perceptions of us. And it's all looked after uh, by um, a German federal agency whose logo is on the right here, a very long German uh, title. But um, I am and we as the Bricksmith Association are very grateful to this German uh, federal agency for allowing us to use the photographs and documents that they have on uh, Bricksmiths and other uh, incidents of this sort. So we now have access to a lot of information, probably about 20 serious incidents. We have the full Stasi files, often with the, the photographs that go with them. And the other thing that has become available to us uh, are the United States missions um, annual reports from 1965 through to the end of the Cold War. And for a long time, we were missing the Bricksmiths annual reports. Uh, and about six or seven years ago, I put in a freedom of information request because they weren't in, in queue. And I said, where are, you know, they should exist. Can they please be released? They had actually been uh, declassified as early as 1992, but no one had ever asked for them. And so no one did anything with them. Anyway, about 10 days after I'd put in my request, the telephone rang at home and uh, I answered it and there was a, a lady called Tracy in the Royal Naval Base in Portsmouth. And I said, oh, hello, what can I do for you? No, she said, Mr. Williams, it's what I can do for you. She said, those documents, they'll be with you tomorrow. And the following day, Postman Pat arrived with 1,500 pages <laughs> of photocopied um, annual reports. So um, uh, we have a lot more information than we had, as it were, in, in the 1990s, just after the end of the Cold War. All of, what, all of which brings me to Athenstedt, how it's actually pronounced in German. None of us can quite work out if it's Athenstedt or Athenstedt. Anyway, we'll call it Athenstedt because it's easier. Um, and a series of serious incidents that took place um, outside, just outside this small um, East German uh, village. Athenstedt lies um, in uh, raised hilly country just to the east of what was the inner German border between the Federal Republic and East Germany. Um, and it was the site of uh, an East German uh, early warning radar station. So there it is, Artenstedt, just to the north of the radar station. And uh, um, not in a yellow area, so an area that we were allowed to, uh, to drive around or nearby. It was a fairly typical early warning radar station. On the left is a tall king uh, radar. We tended, we in the army, tended to leave the Royal Air Force to take, go and take photographs of antennas. You need to be a bit of an anorak to get excited about antennas, and I'm never, thought, never all that excited about it. Um, but there was a need, obviously, to check on the, 
the electronic order of battle occasionally to see if it had been upgraded or um, things had changed. So here, thanks to Google Earth, which of course we didn't have in the 1980s, uh, is uh, the radar site, as it were, and it lies on the side of the minor road going southwest out of uh, the village of Artenstedt uh, over, some, uh, over a hill, uh, it, the radar site on the top of the hill. And it had its arcs facing out uh, to the west um, over the inner German border in case of incursions from the west and part of a chain of stations like this, uh, Soviet and East German stations. In fact, they took it a day at a time and then one of them be switched off today while it was doing maintenance and the other one covered the arc and then the next day they'd swap over. There were two incidents at Artenstedt uh, in 1978, both in September. And the first involved an American uh, vehicle, American patrol tour, um, which uh, tried to drive past down the road on the left-hand side as you look at it, and was um, a barrier was, what the Germans called a schlagbaum, but a barrier was lowered uh, to try and stop them, and the Americans drove straight through the barrier, allegedly damaging an East German Air Force serviceman who was operating this barrier. Um, understandably, when a British tour came to the same place two days later, probably not, not having heard of this incident um, you know, the day before yesterday, um, the British found themselves um, very much uh, entering a hornet's nest. And uh, they were um, taken on by a, a Tatra 813, a, a very heavy truck came whizzing out of the, the main gate. It's not clear from the uh, Bricksmith's reports that have survived or from the Stasi reports whether the Bricksmith's team was rammed or whether they were simply blocked, but they were certainly arrested or was detained, the nicer word we like to use, uh, but they were certainly um, banged to rights and the Stasi um, were um, right on to it. it. It was obvious, I think, at this stage, if it hadn't been before, to the Stasi that the Artenstedt radar site was a perfect place uh, for an ambush if you wanted to try and catch uh, people in the Western missions. Move on to the following year, and the Americans uh, miscalculated, tried to drive, in fact, from south to north, past the main gate in order to get home faster, and were smashed into by one of these huge uh, Tatra trucks. That is a Stasi photograph, and there is the, the underside of this uh, Dodge Ram Charger uh, that had been hit. It rolled twice and came to a halt in the field on its side. Uh, here you see a, a group of uh, East German airmen all being ordered around by a sort of NCO or an officer on the left, and men in white suits who I think we can assume are Stasi investigators um, going through the remains of what has come out of the vehicle. So here's the vehicle on its side, and here is Colonel Hamilton, who was the commander of the American uh, patrol, uh, who was uh, not just badly shaken, he was, uh, his back was damaged, and he, he wasn't well for quite some while thereafter, was taken off to hospital briefly. But all the equipment strewn around, so the, the East Germans, the Stasi, had a, a full inventory, as it were, of, of what the Americans were using as uh, intelligence collection equipment uh, at, that side, at that time. And here is the remains of this Dodge Ram Charger. The Americans put down their survival to the fact that it had uh, roll bars built into it, uh, but certainly they were lucky to get away with their life. And this was a clearly a deliberate ambush. And I say that because we have a whole series of documents. This is one of them. <coughs> Um, uh, a Stasi, a report to the Stasi by the East German Air Force um, saying how they had put out um, radio-equipped vehicles uh, to cover the approach of the Americans as they came closer uh, to the radar site. So they were, they were queued up, as it were, um, by the Stasi of the arrival of this uh, patrol vehicle and then uh, rammed it straight outside the, the main gate. The next um, major incident that occurred at Artenstedt happened, I'm afraid, to me um, in, on the 12th of August 1982. And for years, the only thing I had to 
proved to myself that it ever happened was my thermos, which had been damaged um, in the collision uh, with a Tatra truck. So you can imagine there's a fair old crump to, to crumple your steel thermos like that. And, uh, but I had really nothing else to go on. But thanks to the Stasi files, thanks to the, the official Bricksmith materials that we've gathered, we now have a bit more of a story. So here is um, the brand new chief of Bricksmiths, then Brigadier John Learmont, now General Sir John, uh, on the left, and his driver, Corporal John Boland. And the chief had been there for about three weeks, and I was summoned by the ops officer who said, take the chief out on a, on a tour, on a patrol, um, let him see what we do, let him take a few photographs. We don't expect senior officers to take photographs in focus, um, but let him take a few photographs. Um, <laughs> Give him a good time, and then he'll support us when we get into trouble, which we surely will um, before long. So uh, I did what I was told, and we set off. And here is the brigadier's car, a nice, shiny, black Opal Senator car with a star plate in the bottom left corner of the picture, um, and very obviously the British brigadier out and about. He was the most senior person in any of the three Western missions. The other two were commanded by colonels. And uh, uh, we set off uh, naively believing that we were protected against evil by the star plate and, uh, and so forth. We set off to go south from Potsdam and for about the first half, half a dozen hours we were uh, dogged by close surveillance from the, from the Stasi. They were trying to see if the new brigadier operated in the same way as the last brigadier. Was this normal? Was there something abnormal? And then they seemed to to disappear. And as we moved west from the town of, of uh, Magdeburg, um, we felt that we were no longer being watched by the Stasi. There you go. You can believe what you like, but we obviously were still uh, under, under surveillance. My plan, a loose plan, I should say, uh, was to go west, avoiding the yellow areas, which we weren't allowed to go into, towards the inner German border, and then turn south into the Hartz Mountains, a pretty part of the world. I thought the Brigadier would enjoy the Hartz Mountains. And, uh, of course, I'd failed to work the route out properly. And there in the middle of, the, uh, of these two arrows is the village of Artenstedt and the dreaded um, radar site. But what you don't know about doesn't frighten you, and off we, off we went. And as we uh, uh, approached um, Artenstedt, we could see the radar site on the hill on the other side of the valley. And uh, we decided that we'd push on anyway. We didn't imagine for a moment that it would be alongside the road. Normally, they were well set back from the road. And so we kept going uh, into the village. As we came out of the village and started to go up the hill towards the radar station, uh, we saw a mission restriction sign. But I reminded the brigadier that it didn't mean anything, it was just an advertisement that there was something behind, going on behind it, and we should keep going. But it, the closer we got to the top of the hill, the more I had an uneasy feeling that this wasn't going to go very well. So I asked him to put his camera away, and I asked the driver to put his foot on the floor. As we passed the near end of the radar station, I saw in the mirror behind us a man jump out of the ditch and put a barrier across the road. So we're now committed to having to go forward, and uh, here, some years later, but here we're approaching the main gate, which is on the left, you may be able to see a little red car there. Uh, it's in 1990. And as we almost got to the main gate, I thought, right, we're going to be okay. We're going to get past the main gate. If we can get past the main gate, I'm sure we'll be all right. And just as we almost got past, a mummy and daddy-sized 10-ton Tatra truck suddenly came flying out of the main gate and drove straight into us an awkward moment. Here we are uh, trapped between the front of the um, Tatra truck on the right there. The other truck's been put there after the event to block us as if we're going anywhere from there. And on the left hand side of us uh, what saved our life was a, a small fruit tree growing on the side of the road. So we're sandwiched between this 10 ton truck and a fruit tree and it's the one, it's the half a ton of armour plating under the car that has stopped the car just sort of squishing like a crumpled envelope. Um, but miraculously, despite the fact that the 
Tatra truck's bumper went through the driver's side window, um, he managed to dodge it. And all three of us somehow were not noticeably injured. We did have a rather high heart rate, it had to be said, for a while. Um, but we were, we were all right. And anyway, after, once we started to sort of feel a bit better about life, I said to the brigadier, what we need to do, sir, is we'll get out and we'll show them we may be battered and bruised, but we're not beaten. And we'll do what British people do. Uh, we'll, we'll have a brew. And so there are a whole series of secret police photographs showing me making three cups of Nescafe, one for each of us. All the while that this is going on, the Stasi photographers, or photographer, was getting closer and closer, taking more and more uh, pictures and becoming really rather boring. Here he is, the brigadier on the left. And uh, this is the last photograph taken by the Stasi photographer while he was still in his plain clothes, because about half a second after he took this photograph, I threw my cup of coffee and got him from head to toe. It was an immensely satisfying moment. <laughs> but, but as the coffee settled, I thought, mm, perhaps, I perhaps I shouldn't have done that. And sure enough, my personal file describes me as a hooligan later on. Which I, <laughs> anyway, they, the Stasi then got changed into uniform. They thought they'd be safer uh, in uniform. And at one stage in the afternoon, uh, the East German Air Force officers. I'm, my first reaction was to try and think of something to say in German, my German not being very good. And I said, mein General ist nicht amusiert. So my general is not amused. Anyway, uh, I think they got the message pretty soon that they had nearly killed what for them was a general. And by, by about tea time, we were being served herbal tea on a false silver tray by the East German Air Force officers. So we, we felt we were sort of slightly back on the moral high ground again. The Soviets turned up because on these incidents we could only deal officially with the Soviets and on the left is the Soviet uh, commandant, military police commander and <clears throat> me trying to talk our way out of a paper bag as to what we were, what we were doing there. And eventually we were uh, rescued. Here is the car. It managed to drive onto the recovery trailer but was a write-off. Um, but uh, I went to see the ops officer and I said, you, I've brought him back. I think he's had a good time. Um, and uh, he asked me what sort of an idiot I was, or something like that, and dragged me down the corridor, and there's a big sign on the, the wall map around Artinstedt saying, caution, suicide alley. So it helps, time, you know, time spent on preparation and planning is rarely wasted, so a lesson for us all. We were lucky to get away with this, very lucky to get away with this, as indeed had Colonel Hamilton of the American mission been lucky to get away with it. But in March 1984, the French mission um, came to grief through no fault of their own. They were patrolling routinely in the town of Halle, near the headquarters of the 11th Motor Rifle Division of the East German Army, uh, when they were smashed into um, by a truck. This is uh, Agent Chef Warrant Officer Mariotti, um, and uh, he was the, the driver of the vehicle, and was to be the, the victim. So here is the 10-ton um, the truck having driven into their Mercedes car, and there are the poor unfortunate Mariotti who was killed um, instantly in the crash, um, lying by the side uh, of the vehicle. So, um, you know, they weren't unsuccessful every time, unfortunately, the, the Stasi. And uh, here is what's left of that Mercedes car, not a great deal. Um, and Ashton Chef Blancheton, his um, sidekick. Um, the officer, Captain Staub, was seriously injured and had to be taken to hospital. Blancheton, who was also quite badly hurt, refused to leave the scene. He was convinced that the Stasi would put alcohol into Mariotti's body and claim he was drink driving, and he wanted, in any case, to protect the car from looting by the, the Stasi. So, um, a sort of brave man, but a very unfortunate uh, event. And uh, we know that um, this was a, a Stasi uh, directed and planned ambush because the, op the operation orders have survived. And also, this rather extraordinary document has survived, which is a receipt or it's a sort of uh, um, an accountant's uh, letter um, about each of eight. Stasi operators who were given a thousand mark bonus, sort of blood money, for having killed, um, been involved in the killing 
of uh, Warrant Officer Mariotti. There's one last incident at Attenstedt, um, about six months after Mariotti's death, and on this occasion, a Bricksmith um, Range Rover uh, with a Royal Air Force crew um, were coming back uh, past Athenstedt and thought it would, they knew it was a risk, but thought it was probably worth just to, just driving past and they'd be all right. And on this occasion, uh, they weren't crashed into. And it would, it would appear, I think it's a fair assumption, that having killed Mariotti, uh, the Soviets ordered the Stasi to, uh, to lower their level of aggression. So instead of a 10-ton truck, just a light truck. And the, the Royal Air Force squadron leader, Martin Common, decided best to stop rather than ramp up the level of violence. Um, they were held for a while under a tarpaulin in August, not a very nice experience, but um, eventually the tarpaulin was lifted uh, and the, the Soviet military police commander, here he is, Major Popov, arrived to take charge of the scene. And what's quite interesting about this photograph uh, is that uh, that is the tree that saved our life um, two years before. You, the bark is missing from, from where the Opal Senator had been smashed into, into that tree. Uh, they also received at one stage in the afternoon the tea ceremony by the East German Air Force. Uh, not all surprises in East Germany were unpleasant, and so uh, this was um, how they were, they were treated. And then there was a, um, a discussion. Uh, on the left, you have a Stasi officer with rather long sideboards, um, two Soviet officers and an East German officer from the radar site as they worked out the, the incident report, so-called ACT, um, to say what was going on. And, and the, the Bricksmith Patrol had been accused of being uh, behind one of these mission restriction signs. That was the only thing, as far as we're aware, that they were accused of. Uh, Martin Common here, seen on the left, looking sort of defiant, was having none of this. He wasn't going to sign anything. Anyway, we weren't, we weren't allowed to sign documents because we didn't know what we were signing. Um, and he's saying, no, I'm not having any of it. And eventually was taken by the East Germans down the road to the mission restriction sign to be shown it. And here he's doing a sort of Nelsonian job of not seeing the mission restriction sign that, uh, that they want to show to him. Um, but it was a, a, a quite different um, uh, ambiance from the, from the killing of Mariotti. And eventually, here is the final uh, farewell handshakes uh, between the East German Air Force, uh, the Royal Air Force, and the Soviet Army. So not all incidents were... Uh, were potentially lethal at Artenstedt, but they're all significant and all covered, or certainly the last three, covered in some detail by the Stasi, both on paper and uh, in photographs. Things move forward, and then much to our surprise and to some of us disappointment, uh, the wall came down. Uh, why you'd end something as good as this, I don't know, but um, the wall came down, and uh, within um, less than a year, so on the eve of German reunification, which happened on the 3rd of October uh, 1990. On the 2nd of October, all three Western mich missions in East Germany and the three Soviet missions in Western Germany were um, deactivated, as it were, uh, and these, these intelligence collection uh, activities uh, ceased. There's a slight epilogue to the story. I went back with my wife to Artenstedt um, 10 years ago and the, the radar sail has been replaced by a wind turbine. This is the way, the way of today. It's all very good. Um, and the, the site, the radar site, is, is either abandoned uh, or and a bit of it's used as a police dog training camp. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to try and find this character here, who's the driver of the 10-ton truck that had smashed into us in 1982. And the Stasi reports uh, give the village where he came from, but his name is redacted but the people's police report gives his name and then redacts where he came from. So you didn't, <laughs> didn't have to be Sherlock Holmes to, to work this one out. And I sent a message through an intermediary to him and said, would he meet me uh, at the scene? And he, his reply was perfectly reasonable. He said, yes, he would, but only if I accepted that he was only acting under orders. I said, I'm sure I've heard that one before. Um, but uh, so here we are. I'm glad to say I'm the one in the hat. We, we met at the, the scene of the, uh, of the incident. 
And I said to him, what happened on that day? It was a long time before, you know, 30 years, nearly 30 years before. He said, well, we got, he was the chef on the, on the radar site, but he was the duty corporal that day. And it was the duty of the duty corporal to drive the 10-ton truck if the ambush order was given. And he said, we got a telephone call from the Stasi, or our bosses got a telephone call from the Stasi about 30 minutes before you arrived. And so I climbed into the truck and I revved the engine and I waited for the officer sitting next to me to, to tell me um, to go. When he went go, I shot across the road. He said, but at the last moment, I touched the brakes, I'll likely tell, I, I touched the brakes so we didn't hit you as hard as we might have done. So I said, oh, thank you very much. I said, what happened to you after the event? Oh, he said, I got two weeks extra holiday for having rammed you. <laughs> and I, I wondered out loud, I said to him, I wonder what would have happened if you'd killed us. Oh, he said, we knew exactly what would happen if we killed you. And I went, oh, yeah. He said, no, we were going to get six weeks holiday and a thousand marks bonus. And so I think having a thousand marks bonus having been given to the people who killed Mariotti, he was probably quite right um, in that as an estimate. So that brings me really to the end. I think it's, it's worth saying that although it's easy to make a sort of jolly cat and mouse um, drama about this as if it was a high-risk sport, um, there's no doubt that the Stasi who, against whom we were operating uh, were amoral, ruthless, and perfectly prepared uh, to kill if ordered to do so. And in the case of uh, Warrant Officer Mariotti, they actually achieved the aim. But they could quite easily have killed Colonel Hamilton and his crew member from the American mission. They could quite easily have killed Brigadier Learmont, um, and me and the driver. Uh, our shiny black car had been no protection at all against their, um, their intentions. Um, and it's just poor Mariotti. It was just the French who drew the short straw that day by driving past and were slammed into um, by the Stasi and killed. So I think he deserves to be both um, remembered and respected for his sacrifice. And that, I think, really, ladies and gentlemen, is, is enough. I would be very happy, Danny, if people have questions to, to try and answer them. But thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>